just doing a just chatting stream to catch up with uh, the latest updates, I guess, from myself and just thoughts and whatnot that's been uh, going on. Um, the stuff in the background, we'll get to that soon. Uh, and yeah, but first, the music that's playing, let me just drag that out the way. Um, actually, let me just hide it. Oh, there we go. So Tip Stevens, he's another uh, Twitch person. He's in the music category, uh, French streamer, really good music. Um, and I've had a few calls with him to help him uh, with his pronunciation. So I was able to hear his latest music before it's released and kind of advise him and it's really happy. And one of the things we talked about is being able to stream his music uh, in my streams as the background music. So he's been okay with that. So I've got whatever song is currently playing on Spotify in that corner there. So that's, that's good. Uh, now, let me put back in the big brave. I'll share my browser. So one of the things I just did yesterday and this morning, or actually let me share myself. Yeah, there we go. Oh, it's fine. So a while ago, I got my little whiteboard and then instead of, so daily habits and we got clean, make bed, run, whatever. Now, instead of crossing it out, I thought, hey, it's better. Why not just erase it, right? And then write the number of the streak, like how many days I've done it instead. And I thought that's a brilliant idea. And one of the other things I did for this is for these little habits, I've got different alternatives for it. So for read, uh, there's book, Kindle, audiobook, or wiki. For work, different kind of things for work. For play, GeoGuess, a movie, Omegle. Uh, learn, so language, improvement, and study. So what I did is with Coda, uh, and let me get back to sharing Brave. Here we go. I went and I did up a little coded document to kind of implement that idea and improve it. So today I've already done uh, clean and laundry. What laundry is still kind of in progress. Uh, so I've made my bed and I've cleaned. So we can see like the active streak so far. So I've done these uh, three days in a row. Exercise. So I did a run this morning. So and I did a run yesterday. That's why yesterday's clicked out. So if I do today, then we'll see that today no longer becomes interactive and it's added it and I've got the streak and then exercise has gone green. So you can see that for the habit exercise, I've got these options, run, walk, row, skip, uh, for, so like jump rope. For um, clean, I've got clean laundry, make bed. But we can see, you know, which ones are actually like the streak for the individual or the streak also for the overall habit. So read, I listen an audiobook today, so I've been listening to Swan's Way. Now it's kind of cool because I've got this intention here. So I can actually, uh, for notes, I can save this. So let's say I change my book. Uh, so the next book I think I'll be listening to, well, a while ago I listened to Moby Dick. So if I save, this is my intention. And then I go back, um, so let's go read, or remember Moby Dick. But let's put in Swan's Ways, that's what I'm reading right now. And if I click, yep, I read it today. And if we go to the database of what it's actually saving here, we'll see that Swan's Way was committed for today. So that's really cool. Um, so work, uh, these are the things that I've currently, my project, so that you can see my intention here. Uh, and then what I can do is when I've, let's say today I do the share box thing, I just do share box and then click today or yesterday whenever I did it. So these are kind of, for my habit of work, these are the kind of different options for my work and then I can knock them off for today. So we can see that I've been working on my finances. 
uh, the past two days. And I will talk about that more uh, today, kind of some of the things I've been doing there. I'm not, I'm not the best at it by any means, um, but I think it's kind of nifty. All right. Um, so yeah, for work, we've got play, uh, GeoGuessr, movie, Amigo, drum, social, learn, so language improvement study. So I'm going to recommit to learning a language, so learning Indonesian. And I also decided for reading, the most impactful book that I've ever read was how to read a book. And yet I never thought maybe I should read a book on how to learn a language. Like, and the thing with philosophy was when I engaged in philosophy in 2018, I thought, hey, I have a mind, I should learn how to use it. And then when I was reading, I was like, I want to read books, I should learn how to read properly. Um, like at an a academic level. Uh, so for language learning, I've been struggling with it for years. Like I know maybe 30 programming language or 20 programming languages now, but speaking languages I've always struggled with. So I've tried learning German uh, 10 years ago. I tried learning Indonesian. I tried learning Chinese. Uh, and I always kind of put in like a few hundred hours and then just kind of give up. Um, deciding that it's not worth the opportunity cost compared to other things. And that was also a big struggle that I had because to get good at a language, you need to put in 10,000 hours, but 10,000 hours is like for mastery. So it's like, well, you could either take that up in a profession um, and put those 10,000 hours into something that will help you in your career or your profession compared to learning a language. So is really putting 10,000 hours into learning a language worth it compared to all the other things you could be doing? Um, but I decided, well, if I read one of these books, um, how to learn a language, then maybe it won't take 10,000 hours anymore um, to get to a kind of proficient rather than native or expert or academic level. Um, because if, Maybe it'll take a thousand hours to get to a level where you're fine 80% of the time. And then it takes another 9,000 hours to get to that remaining 20%. So for instance, with learning English, uh, I was told when I was a teenager, because of career wise, don't use anything besides the 1000 most popular words, but that kind of, because then your language becomes more accessible. But that means that your quality of your thoughts really degrade because you don't have the ability to conceptualize what it is that you mean and what it is you think and what it is you feel because you lack the ability to express it um, because you lack the tools to conceptualize or understand. Uh, so I decided, well, maybe just going a, th a thousand hours in I can get that 80% um, benefit for 20% of the effort, and I can still not really suffer an opportunity cost. So that seems to be the best of both worlds. Uh, Rust here is a programming language. I want to learn that so I can experiment with a cryptocurrency blockchain technology called Radix. Um, so growth, we've got some few things here for growth. So character management, so building up character, uh, so Napoleon Hill, he wrote a book hundred years ago called Thinking Grow Rich, which is kind of the foundation of personal development, uh, or the industry of personal development. And in that book, there's the self-analysis questions, uh, and then action management. How can we turn our thoughts into action because we are rewarded for our action. We're not rewarded for our thoughts. So in regards to daily, weekly monthly review and planning. That's essentially uh, this thing. So I, I need to actually tap yesterday there um, for action management. So the streaks thing is kind of what I did yesterday and today. So yeah, all right, and then streaming. So now that I'm kind of doing that, that's kind of cool. So let's say, yeah, 
I'm doing that today and I will do that today as well. So, and then we've got vice. So, so far that's been so good on avoiding vices. All right, so that's the little coded document. I will, once I flesh this out more over the month or so, then I'll release it. Uh, Cause I think this is really nifty. I don't want to kind of get rid of the issues in it. Um, before I kind of advertise it further or really share it with other people. So I avoid an inconvenience cost if things don't really work out. All right, uh, so that's the first topic. Let me open up the uh, Twitch stream. Let's just see. Okay, so we've got a viewer and there's no chat. So if you wanna uh, jump in on the chat, you're, you're free to do so. All right, so next thing to discuss is let me do just the general learnings then uh, from today from the book. Uh, so yeah, let's go back to me. Let me just zoom in on myself some more. <laughs> so we got to get rid of that black on those sides. Yeah, there we go. All right, so there's a book that I'm reading, Swan's Way. Uh, it's part of the how to read a book reading list. Uh, before that, I knocked off Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann, uh, Swan's Way. Let me see who wrote that. Uh, Marcel Proust. So that's the book that I'm working through. The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann was a kind of a great book. I, I got a lot from that. Uh, notably that, hold up, let me, let me pause the music just because I can't reflect and listen to music at the same time. All right, so with Thomas Mann, uh, Magic Mountain, some of the things I got from that was, and I will do a proper stream where I go through all the clips. It'll probably be a fair use stream where I just go through all the clips that I took. So the audiobook notes to think about and document kind of a summary of the book or what I got away from the book, because otherwise it just goes in one ear and out the other, and then you forget everything a year later. So I will do that in a future time. There's some more pressing things for the next uh, three weeks or so, or at least for today. But one of the things I got from Magic Mountain was that in regards to politics, it's been like the same for hundreds of years. The whole left versus right or the liberal versus, um, what would you say? Like the, pretty much the names of the political movements change, but the underlying ideas are very consistent through the history of humanity. So that's been, that was really fascinating, kind of discovering that from this book. Like I you're listening to this book that's written a very long time ago, and yet it's as if he's discussing modern politics in way more precise detail than what you get from the modern news. Uh, it was very surprising. Now, with Swan's Way, uh, maybe 25% of it is really insightful, and then 75% is just fluff. Um, so I'm not digging this book as much as the, the other ones that I've had to go through. Um, however, the first few chapters was quite fascinating because, uh, hold up, let me actually share. So people who are watching the, um, the video or just going through it can find where we are at or when I review the video I can know exactly where I'm at all right let's go back to share yeah there we go so yeah with this book uh the first few chapters it was kind of interesting how 
he talks about like a person as in they employ their faculties and then just in the parts today that I was listening to on my run uh, he was talking about kind of that people themselves I kind of have this celestial body aspect to it where there's a gravity between networks or a gravity between yeah social networks or social people um, and they kind of orbit and pull and tug and impact the flows of each other and there was another learning um, that I had <laughs> um, today that was really nice but I've you know bookmarked it oh that's what it was industry um, how the idea of oneself being industrious is also very similar to the idea of a business or a industry of business or an industry of yeah an industry of business so as a person is industrious also a company is industrious um, and or that there is a a object well not an object but a theme of industry so in the same way we employ our faculties as if our faculties are employees who we then command to do our operation so to do we command our employees of our faculties um, to pursue a particular industry so we can be industrious uh, and I now recall the other thing that I learned from today which was the notion of vessel and there was a uh, analogy that and it's kind of interesting when you read these classics a lot of the time they make these references they make them without any particular uh, directed awareness to it they make these references as if they're already imbued knowledge within the language so in regards to vessel the analogy was that these ships move um, as a vessel like a a commander will send an army upon the vessel of the people but then it immediately referred to as oneself being a vessel for the command of their soul or rather more accurately the body is a vessel for the command of the soul to achieve either vice on the world through a lack of employment of faculty or achieve industri industry and character and um, uh, the fruits of labor uh, by that deployment of um, intention so this notion of the body as a vessel of soul actually has been going deeper into a thoughts that I've been wrestling with for the past few weeks and perhaps longer but especially in the past few weeks which is the notion of self or no self um, which I think part of the goal of civilization is to make it so that children are productive units of the civilization um, which is that the more you can make the civilization operate as well-oiled machinery or not actually make it so the society of the civilization operates as well-oiled machinery that seems to be the principle of civilization or and of civility which makes civilization possible so to be civilized is to interoperate with the cogs of the machinery 
of society as a uh, kind of holistic arrangement of function, including that of defense and offense and internal healing and growth. Um, the offense is interesting uh, in Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain. Uh, they cited, for instance, Voltaire, one of Voltaire's work and uh, the claim by one of the characters that Voltaire believed war was necessary of progress and that it is actually a moral thing because it drives progress. And it's interesting, again, through this development of philosophy, and that's one of the reasons why my goal, one of my goals in this life is to work through all the how to read a book reading list, is to uh, just go through that whole list um, and understand uh, how the structure of the growth of the human spirit has molded and crafted itself uh, over time. So, yeah. So, yeah, we've got the, the vessel aspect. We've got the, um, yeah, the other aspects. I, I think that was pretty good, at least for the summary that I, I wanted to do for that little learning today. All right. Um, all right, so that's the Swan's Way learning. Oh, okay, yeah, so the soul bit the, and the vessel, so the self and the no-self. I was thinking that, yeah, so the part of civilization is to make productive children. And as one studies empire and enterprise, and enterprise is interesting because we have enterprise in terms of commercial companies or corporations like a like Elon Musk would have a he's he's an enterprising individual because he's built an enterprise uh, and one can use the same term when it comes to a teenager who is very good at hustle and entrepreneurial activities they are building uh, their own enterprise over their career and they are an enterprising individual uh, so part of uh, so the civilizing quality compared to just a society or or tribes or primitive uh, tribes so civilization was a psychotechnology that was unlocked um, in the Neolithic period, so 10,000 BC um, in the Levant, and then it spread uh, outwards into China and uh, the Egypt and further south and then gradually everywhere else. Um, because the Neolithic period, it allowed... Um, Several innovations occurred in that uh, time period. Uh, one was agriculture. Uh, the other one was most notably the ability for the dead to talk to the living, which was through uh, long form written and or long form communication um, to kind of last. So scrolls and literature and literacy. Uh, to an extent, uh, and that allowed the enterprise of humanity to really come forth. But one of the things that separates um, that, so prior to civilization, the kind of max social unit would be below 10,000 people. Um, but to go beyond that, you need the infrastructure, not just the physical infrastructure of f 
foo like of the the main measurement of how one measures whether a society has progressed in a civilization is specialization but notably that of those who make food and those who make other goods so the birth of cities um and but so you have a uh, physical infrastructure that kind of allows this which is innovations with agriculture to allow farming that is prone to the season so rather than just being hunter gatherers at the whims of nature for when they eat instead you can terraform the environment to produce food uh, rather than only uh, take food you can make food and then also with so there so there's that aspect so infrastructural innovation but there's also social innovation which is getting people hold up let me put that further down so you're not just staring at my head um yeah so there's also further innovation uh or social innovation which is to allow people to not just have a give me that culture uh which is one where if they see prosperity they believe that prosperity should be shared rather than um uh invested and sharing and investment are different because and investment is ultimately more virtuous than sharing. And let me explain. So investment or with sharing, let's say one farmer produces a tremendous amount of potatoes. They're more effective than 80% of the other people and they produce 80% of the potatoes. Um, if they were then to uh, share equally with everyone, then you have a, the rewards are going to ineffective operation. Whereas if the rewards consolidate into those who are productive, then the 1,000 potatoes that year can then turn into 10,000 potatoes the next year. But if resources such as fertilizer are distributed evenly, to even the most ineffective people, then that 1,000 potatoes is constrained. Now, there is a aspect where, th and this is not to uh, disassociate from the virtue of humanitarian efforts or philanthropy, which is to, there is a benefit to um, keeping humans afloat which is a separation between the action of a human and the soul so keep the soul alive and healthy but direct that soul towards where it can be useful to the enterprise of civilization so if there's an ineffective farmer, perhaps I'll be better as a blacksmith and stop wasting the resources that would go towards the effective farmers or whatnot. And perhaps to become, and perhaps they're completely useless, then schooling to then train them would be a better option rather than keeping them as useless. And even today, uh, through the undeveloped world to the developed world, there is a issue where um let's see if i can make myself bigger while i expound on these things um uh, da, da, da. yeah there we go that's that's better um and let's let's see hold up whoa ah cool there we go. All right. Share. Yeah. All right. So there we go. Um, 
All right, so yeah, with uh, uh, what, what was I talking about? The uh... oh yeah, so oh, directing the resources to improving the efficiency of one soul, which includes schooling and healing. Um, to then be productive for the enterprise so the enterprise can move together again as a holistic improvement um, including all humans within so uh, with that and so we can start to see how there is balance and nuance between just between sharing and investment so it is worthwhile to invest in where there will be the most return holistically and is also equally worthwhile to share to invest in people rather than their ineffectivities so invest in someone so they can manifest that investment in the way that is best for them uh, so, in regards to society or the civilizing quality, so we can kind of see where, like, a give me that culture that just believes in sharing rather than investment um, is constrained. Or one that is, you know, this superficial idea of um, right wing politics, which is that one should never share, they should only invest. Well, then you have one that becomes fragile because it's only invested in certain means of production. And if those means fail due to drought or plague or one of the other damnations of God, and I'm using God in including in a secular fashion, which is the rule maker or the laws of order of the world which we observe rather than which we com we are at the mercy of compliance so we can't change laws of physics all we can do is understand and mold our relationship to them and understand them with better clarity so we can't just, you know, as much as we want, you know, become Dragon Ball Z fighters and who can fly unless we can find a way to comply with the laws of the world to make it so. So God can be used in that same way, which is the force behind the laws that we must comply. So there is benevolent aspects to that force that god and there is also uh detrimental aspects such as plague and damnation and whatnot which is also why the primitive gods were jealous vindictive gods um, who demanded appeasement and as uh humans created a more comfortable society than one could express love for God rather than just fear. So then with this, uh, we can see that cultures that did not develop many of these psychotechnologies, such as group cooperation, uh, investment uh the respect for god versus just respect for man then there was no ability for a society to surpass a certain threshold of human cohabitation so the neolithic period through its innovations of agriculture, religion, civility, what enabled finally 
uh, civility, which is this idea of self is more than animalistic impulses. And reduction of human as animal, but the in an animal world, but the divinity that human surpass uh, animal in its ability to transcend the limitations of uh, of what would you call it of forces that pull one down into the earth to be reconsumed so I while ago I did up a note let me see if I can share it if I have it um, I call it the two gods uh, and I was yeah here we go um, so let me see if I can share this um, all right Uh, so this is a note I did up on 11th of February, um, and that is way too small. So let me just drag me to the side and let me make this horizontal. So it's a vertical uh, portrait, right? Uh, canvas. So yeah, gravity is gods. Here we go. Um, let me make me small. Dot, 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 drag me down there. All right, so gravity is God. So uh, we have here kind of the progression of humans. So from the left, we have child, um, which is kind of dependent on environment or dependent on anal on adults. And is this animalistic sta state. So we have the Garden of Eden here, the apple falling. So the tree of knowledge here. Um, and one of the things that is perceived as, th so the tree of knowledge gave humans the knowledge of mortality and therefore everything that then comes with that illumination of one as mortal includes that of sacrifice and sacrifice is needed, well a prerequisite of sacrifice or even of mortality is time. So time, or rather, actually, no. Mortality is the prerequisite for time. If you're immortal, um, time may not be possible to perceive because there would be no uh, existential requirement for it to exist, for it to be recognized. Because... Without mortality, there is no evolutionary natural pressure to evolve anything. Um, it is mortality that causes the evolutionary process because it forces one to survive. Um, so... The tree of knowledge, yeah, it births mortality and therefore awareness of time and then awareness of time births the awareness of scarcity. Well, sorry, I should say that mortality and time together birth scarcity because you've just had time without mortality. There is no concept of scarcity. You have un abundant time. If you have mortality without time, uh, you really can't probably have mortality without time. They kind of come together and perhaps maybe as equal gods to be respected. But together they then birth scarcity. And with scarcity you then, and all of these three in this inverse pyramid, 
or this trinity, you then have the uh, so mortality, time, scarcity, everything that evolutionary adaption creates um, in terms of things like shame, modesty, virtue, vice, and whatnot. So this causes, um, and I have different stages here. So action, life, hope, agency, command. And this is again, something I did in February. So I've, I'm re trying to reimagine um, what I intended uh, here. Uh, so then, yeah, we can now cognizize and we are evicted from the Garden of Eden. Um, so we are evicted from a utopia. And a utopia means that which is no place. Um, so it doesn't actually exist beyond uh, imagination. But it's kind of interesting. Um, I read a book called Utopia, with that, which on was on the How to Read a Book reading list. And I guess since uh, Plato's Republic, um, there has been a quest on the frontier of civilization to imagine a harmonious civilization, one that solves its ills, and therefore is utopian. The most popular version of that would be Brave New World, or even 1984, um, depending on your persuasion on, on them. So we have, uh, yeah, the little uh, yeah, snake here, um, the apple. So then we can cognizize and we evicted. Now we have a man uh, crying because now we know that we must survive. Uh, and these tears kind of go into the earth and then splant a seed. And then we can create fire. Uh, so we kind of are aware of our matter and then of our soul. So with the flame of uh, humanity is kind of this hugely empowering thing. So we actually invented fire before we were homo sapiens, um, which is fascinating to me. Uh, it was other hominoids, uh, ancestral, uh, hominoids that invented fire. Um, so then with fire and that it's importance because for fire, there's lightning and that causes fire or natural fires, mostly by lightning, but to actually be able to use one's ingenuity to command fire, then we see something that has separated humans from all other animals, which is that it is this birthing of something that is beyond animal and it is something sacred. So there was a movie called The First King, which is brilliant. It's about Romulus and Remulus. And it's actually about which were the, the king of Rome. Uh, and the movie goes into the selective pressures that birthed a king versus a um, emperor. Or rather an emperor kind of would come after a king, but versus a, a, a leader, or maybe not even leader, like a tyrant. Um, so it kind of births this uh, growth beyond. And in the movie, they have the priestess maintains the flame as respect for this God that pulls upward as against this God that pulls downwards. So we can, again, to continue this journey, so we now have man with this flint rock, um, which in the old days were obsidian, um, which is a volcanic glass uh, that they would use. Uh, so we've now got fire and now we can offer that to that which makes us more than animal. So Hearth Realm and Surrender Realm. So Hearth, there was a book that I read a while ago. Ah, oh, that's what it was. It was Madame Bovary. And they talked about 
a respect for the hearth of the fire. And maybe it was a few different things that I read at that time. And that's kind of how my learnings happen. I kind of consume a lot within a one or two week period and then draw synchronicities between them uh, to unlock a concept that uh, it was on my periphery, but then I it revealed itself, to, its form revealed uh, itself. Uh, and so like for something to be revealed, it has to be there already. And then its form becomes aware. So for instance, when something reveals itself from the shadows, it was already in the shadow and then it reveals. So it's not to say that I invented it. Uh, it's to say that it was there and then its form, I, I recognize its form. Um, so for the hearth, uh, there was this idea of the hearth of the fire was something that demanded respect and tradition and uh, rights that the fire itself was a entity of rights and to be in the hearth you would take off your shoes and not allowed to dry your shoes near the fire and you would make a prayer before you would ignite the fire so there's the hearth realm which is this like kind of yeah and then hearth realm and surrender realm i and i i wish and one of the Beverly products that will enable this is Fountain, and I've talked about that for years, but it's always been more pressing matters of why it hasn't happened. But these kind of videos that I wish to do on Twitch will hopefully be a bridging uh, to that, which is just a way to kind of document these realizations as I have them, rather than six months later when I've kind of forgot. So we've got the health, health realm and the surrender realm, and then we see now this man offering the fire and we've got civilized and then we now have the invention of love and then we can thrive with agriculture um so only here do we become really adults and then we've got birth so what is this kind of offering to the giver of spirit so the god of pull-up forces so confidence spirits statue um fertilization and we can see now the rain kind of coming down um so surrounded by uh ouroboros however man pierces um and transcends heavens and ground so there's the notion of like the yin and the yang or the ouroboros so like a pyramid we build the pyramid to this giver of spirit the god that which gives us sun and then you know this bowl of fire in the sky that gives us light and heat and warmth and um, sustenance uh, but with the invention of fire we become like the god in the sky we imitate it um, to an extent so the gr so we have yeah the giver spirit which is action life hope agency command these are all kind of things of this uh, upper world so both gods draw offering sacrifice benefit and faith um, so now here we have the other god um, which is the taker of spirit and you can think of this as a big worm that lives underground um, so one is this hand that pulls us upwards to the sky it is trying to pull us up and the other one kind of pulls us down or breathes us down you know moby dick is a great uh example of this the imagery or the canon around moby dick is this whale that is below and and sucks things underneath but at the same time is a force to be respected and has its role so kind of the taker of spirit we have monopoly uh <laughs> i have investment there in burial um so investment here is like the seed um 
We plant seeds in the take of a spirit, right? The rain falls down to the earth and then life kind of comes up and then reaches to the sky again. So it's not actually something just to be fear or like a devil. Um, it's both have equal respect. We plant things into the earth uh, to bring out life. We fertilize the soil. So the shadow realm is the pull down God swallows into darkness, into the unconscious, into sleep, then germinates into light, conscious and wakefulness. And what is this process here? What does it take? Well, it goes through this judgment and then it cleanses it. Um, so if it, you know, can be redeemed, it is cleansed and then it is then germinated back. Or it is judged and then it's destroyed. It's this purgatory. It goes into the flames of the underworld, this burning hell. Uh, and then it's offering underneath burns to the sky, right? The incense to new forms, right? A common offering is the burn incense. Well, what is it? We're going through this destruction um, to then create something uh, new. So what the worm does is even worms in real life, they consume and then their shit becomes fertilizer, right? So even for humans, <laughs> uh, we can use our shit as fertilizer, even as our bodies, when we die, um, our body can be fertilizer. Uh, so we have this thing where, or even like, yeah, so we've got like darkness, unconscious sleep, like these are all aspects of this thing that goes into this judgment of cleansing or destruction uh, to then create new form. So matter, souls, bodies. Uh, and there was another image. Do I have the other image around this? Um, uh, move to... Uh, so there was a few different ones. Uh, so it would have been around February, I guess. Um... Let me see if I can just pull it up. Or if it is there at all. Okay, I can't seem like I find it, unfortunately. Um, so I had another drawing um, where I kind of imagined, oh, that's what it is. It was a physical one on pen and paper somewhere. So I don't think I actually have it. Unless I did it a very long time ago. Let's just, just give me a moment. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have it. Um, so, yeah, so this Ouroboros thing is interesting. So when we know this, right, we ground the temple in the earth and we point it to the sky as our tribute. And the Ouroboros is the snake that kind of wraps around the world, as we can think. Um, but it's also, it's a snake kind of eating its own tail. And I think the best way to actually visualize it is the Ouroboros is around the pyramid. Um, and it's kind of like the human realm, like the cyclic nature of it eats its own tail. But if we utilize this divinity that we have, then we can reach to the heavens. Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, so we have this vessel thing. Oh yeah, so that's the, the other image. It was kind of a conceptualization of like the soul and the vessel and kind of how it operates, which is uh, kind of conceptualizing the ether, the great source or infinite intelligence, all the different ways it's used as a word. Um, 
So it's the same kind of concept, which is, uh, but instead of it being our soul is connected to only the heavens and then we are condemned to hell, instead our soul, ex so this is like the physical plane, but there's also then the spiritual plane, but it is wrong to imagine um, our soul as just planted on earth as a now isolated unit without any umbilical cord to anything else, right? But it's more as if the umbilical cord of our soul remains connected to the ether at all times, but the ether is best imagined as a, um, there's a certain shape, it's like a, a donut. Um, so if you imagine a donut, our soul is in the hole of the donut. And the umbilical and everything outside the donut is the ether. And the umbilical cord, visually, we can conceive it as either going upwards or going downwards. But it's the same emptiness or oneness that is everything outside the donut and we are within. So whether we visualize the umbilical cord going upwards or going downwards, it's still connecting to the same, same space. Um, but in regards to liter literary purpose um, or anthropocentric pur purpose, we can then consider it to have a certain meaning. So each kind of, we can then imagine the playground of different souls as a whole bunch of donuts levitating in space with each soul in the middle of this donut and uh, whether or not they are being more like a force of the pull down God or a force of the pull upwards uh, God, uh, we can then imagine them as descending further downwards, uh, like that umbilical cord going downwards, or their umbilical cord going upwards. And then I guess then working in swan's waves, celestial bodies way, we can then imagine these celestial donuts of souls um, kind of gravitating and moving towards each other. So if you get a uh, group together of those who are, you know, worshipping or aligning with the forces that pull down, then uh, they form their own uh, gravity or even perhaps a vortex that starts pulling those who are fighting for upwards trajectory into that vortex or that whirlpool or, or others like sometimes when things are going very positive we can say it was like a tornado and we get pulled upwards and when things are going poorly we can say it's like a whirlpool that pulled us down um, but it's interesting here which is the evolutionary reason for suicide is to stop wasting the resources of the social unit so Suicide is one of, uh, uh, there's in evolutionary camp in the 90s, it was very common for only individual evolution as the, the gr biggest dominating uh, frame of the science of evolution at the time. However, individual evolution alone does not explain many things such as Suicide, and then with the invention of game theory, which is that game theory revealed itself to the inventors who articulated it, um, then collective evolution or evolution or group evolution now made sense, which is that which would be obvious to any uh, social unit, which is that it 
the survival of the individual is less important as the survival of the group. And therefore the group then develops evolutionary adaptions within the individual to promote the survival of and prosperity of the group. So for instance, in a bug in the movie Ants, we have the certain bug in the war scene which explodes, right? And this is a common uh, defense mechanism in not many animals, in some animals, where the individual will explode with toxicity to protect their group. Um, and obviously that's not, to make sense for that is for individual survival is uh, poor. So that is something of group survival. Um, so for the pull down thing, as we get depressed, we, we are depressing ourselves back to one is if we don't learn, it is to be our physical matter to be swallowed and purged. But this flame, this, this tree of knowledge allowed us to cognize and have this spiritual realm that mimics the physical realm. So we can look inside and purge the aspects of our character that, that no longer serve. And so we can self judge and we can cleanse what is good and we can purge what is bad about us. So therefore our body can realign with, or not really our body, but so our soul can reorientate the trajectory of its vessel to achieve um, a harmonious relationship with the world and its forces that pull above and the forces that pull below. So, uh, with that, let me just also double check my audio is still coming through. Yep, good. So, uh, so in terms of vessel, uh, we can think the instance in Swan's way that they talked about was they were bringing like the story of uh, Odyssey and also the Iliad. So Homer's works, I covered them on the Beverly podcast. Uh, in terms of the ship is a vessel for its men and and the the purpose of of the men, um, and I'm using men by its dictionary definition, which is the gender neutral pronoun of the English language. Um, because a woman can function as a man, but a, uh, a man can't function as a woman, unfortunately. Um, so man is accessible to both, uh, gen both sexes. However, woman is not accessible to both sexes. All right. Uh, and that's why, like, that's why the language works the way it does in so many languages, um, where the male pronouns are the, the gender neutral pronouns. All right. So, uh, we have there then, um, the vessel idea. So with the soul always connected to the ether, so the donut, we're inside the donut and the soul is everything outside this donut. And you can think therefore the donut is only the magnetic field of the soul, right? Um, and then you would have the hippies uh, who would then refer to that as one's aura, right? When they talk about observing one's aura, they're talking just about this, which is that is their soul embodied within a vessel which magnetic force is aligned more so with the God that pulls below or the God that pulls upwards, the giver of spirit or the taker of spirit, right? However, again, both is vitally important. The reason we come depressed 
is one, either to stop wasting resources, and also, because we are human, to divine our way to stop wasting resources, which is to, again, judge, which is what causes us to do, be depressed. We realize we're wasting resources, and then we cleanse what works, and we destroy what doesn't work. Um, and to actually commit suicide uh, is either a great act of respect or it is one of cowardice against the divinity of oneself um, because it has foregone one's ability to reinvent themselves, to command one's vessel uh, rather than to be victim of the world as if one's soul does not exist, as if one is a machine. So to then reticulate this back to um, this idea of civilization civility, we can see that a civilization needed to go through all of these steps, which is it needs to eat from the tree of knowledge so it can actually cognize its environment it needs to be able to then know what survival and striving is and to not just survive, but to strive. And then finally to civilize, which is this idea that there is something to work towards that separates us from just the child or the animal. So it is the adult's responsibility. Uh, so we can define adult as independent, capable agent. Now, independent doesn't mean um, that it is isolated. Independent just means that it is no longer dependent in terms of entirely dependent. So we imagine a baby. It is completely dependent on adult. Otherwise, it dies. So adult is someone who is, I mean, child is just dependent, incapable, and non-agent, right? So agent is a term to describe the ability and it is a legal term but as equally as it is a spiritual term. So agent implies that we have agency, that we have the spiritual capacity to invent our future, that it is not just um, circumstantial. So for a baby, it doesn't have any, like, well, it does, but it's not aware. Um, so, you know, a baby could decide to stop breathing. <laughs> Um, but it's not yet developed the cognizant abilities to kind of decide on that. And that's why we have the age of consent. And also as an adult, we then have legal rights. And it is a progressive thing in different areas, um, this development towards agency, which is once we are now recognized as an agent, it is to then say we have the responsibility of self-authorship. And that responsibility therefore carries all the burden and empowerment of self-authorship, which is this dividing line here. Above is, as soon as we have this flame part, we kind of recognize we now have, well, it's kind of interesting, like the cog cognizance aspect on the left. Oh, you can't see my cursor. God. Okay, unfortunately, you won't be able to see my cursor. Um, let's see, unless I make it really big, and then I share my... Do you see my... Okay, now you see my cursor. Okay, brilliant. Um, all right, so yeah, cognizance here. Uh, so we can probably perceive we have self-authorship 
uh, to some extent, but really not until we have the fire. Because even like, let's say we're, we're now cognizing and we're surviving, now we're striving. This can still be a might is right civilized, uh, society. And I, you, I decided to use society versus civilization here because a large aspect of civilization is might is right at the largest extent as the operation of the civilizational unit, but not in terms of the individual. The individual requires this concept of civilizing to thrive together, um, where if an individual believes might is right, then you do not have the capacity to be civil because whoever is strongest defines all the rules, but that doesn't produce any type of relationship towards what any type of respect for the giver of spirit. It still perceives oneself as God rather than as God as these two forces. Um, so might is right is a perception of oneself as God. Um, unless you, again, a, as an individual unit, as we progress into civilization, like say the Spartans, and is a good example of this, where they would kill deformed children to stop them wasting resources for a society that existed in a time where strength was survival but within those who weren't deformed who lived the they it wasn't might is right it was together we can fight for our life and for our tribe and for our virtues and and civilization so uh with our education prior to a hundred years ago it was a indoctrination into the classical works as a deliberate ability to no deliberate intention to become equal to the author and to be on the plane of the frontier of the human spirit to progress it further in commune in leadership of the commune of one's peer, because literacy was rare. However, um, there has been a other force within human that has existed a long time, which is a deliberate suppression of humanity into reduction of human to machine, to child, to animal, to plant. So one of the best uh, comedy skits I've ever seen uh, in my life, and I was laughing for longer than I could ever imagine. Um, I'll share it in the stream. I just think it's brilliant. Uh, What's her name? Uh, Puppy Plant. Yeah, here we go. Ah, I'm sharing my whole desktop. <laughs> uh, all right. Okay, that's fine. Um, and let me make sure that the audio for that will come through. Yeah, okay, good. So this to me is one of the best social satires of civilization and civilizing. It is one of the best best awareness pieces of the notion of civ of the process of civilizing that I've seen. Oh, 
Oh, okay, you're not hearing that. Loving me. I've been waiting so There we go. Alright. I've been waiting so long for this moment, but we're finally interviewing this plant. Hello, Poppy. Thank you so much for having me. How are you today, plant? You look so beautiful. I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Poppy. You look so gorgeous, I can't even contain myself. Well, I appreciate that. When's the last time you really felt alive? That's a great question. I really don't know. Some days I wake up and I feel like I could take on the world, full of life and energy. And other days I feel like the life has been sucked completely out of me. I feel the same way. You know, I often get down on myself because of the way I look. I find myself wishing I was born a human. You know, plants and humans aren't that different. I guess that's true. I just wish you would stop killing and eating us. You know, it hurts when we die. You just can't hear a scream. It feels good to be alive, don't you think? It truly does. Thank you for not killing me, Poppy. Do you feel the love energy I feel? I bet this plant does. Oh, I feel it every day, and I love it. I see you're contained inside of a base right now. Yes, that is correct. Is that different from being out in nature? It can feel restricting at times, but I've learned to love it. My entire existence on this planet is relatively contained, but I like it that way. I have no real desire to leave my home. Sure, nature seems fun and exciting, but the outside world can be scary, so I choose to remain here. What do you think? Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? Hmm, that's a good question. I suppose I'll vote for whichever candidate is gay. I think they're both gay. <laughs> <laughs> I like this plant. Alright, so to understand Poppy is uh, Poppy the girl. Uh, she is a android. Uh, that is the character she plays. It's a android who is discovering what is humanity. And there really out is of interviewing a plant. And one of the things here is the plant's political opinions are just what is popular or what is not even popular, but what is agreeable. Um, gay can mean gay in the original term of it, which was to be happy and agreeably uplifting was what gay meant originally. And now it means another term, which is essentially the same thing. <laughs> um, now, the plant also says they are in a box and it is restrictive, but they don't mind because they don't... It's better than being out in nature where there is threat and a requirement of agency and a responsibility of agency. Um, so... And there is aspects to both human or android and human and plant, which is feel, feeling. It is living. It is a will to live and a pain when that is threatened, right? That's universal between human, animal, plant, right? Um, but plant can't move. Plant is immobile. Plant is circumstantial. Now, plant does have the will to live and a pre-programmed way of going through things. And some religions would ascribe a soul to a plant and therefore a somewhat an agency uh, to it in its limited capacity that it does have. Um, but we can, therefore, still, we have to accept the limitation, which is immobile. And it does still respect this earlier uh, relationship here between the giver spirit and the taker spirit, which is a plant takes what is underneath and transforms it into fruit such as the tree of knowledge. Its roots are in the underworld and it blooms a fruit that awakens humanity. 
right? Rather than human just being on the bosom of God in this kind of uh, personification of God as human entity, uh, which we nurture from its bosom, we, by eating through the tree of knowledge, we recognize we were child of God. It is now our responsibility to become adult and imitate God in God's image and have that responsibility of creating life and not even creating life because it was animals giving life. We know that from the Noah story. To an extent, maybe, maybe I haven't gotten that far in my Bible reading. Um, but yeah, we that's one of the, the notions here. So plant, immobile, uh, and therefore complacent and agreeable. A child or animal can have moves, but with no divination on moving upwards to spirit or away, it is still, when we prescribe a human as animalistic, we are saying that they are impulsive and they are not... Uh, well, to some extent, some animals, and as humans have learned to become less anthropocentric, there has been a greater respect for the animal kingdom, such as the, the like the beaver or even ants, in terms of how an ant has a civilization, or even a beer, beaver will has architecture, or even a spider has architecture. Um, but what animal does not have is the. They do have monkey see, monkey do, but they don't have write something and learn from the dead. Um, they have that only when it's embodied within them. And maybe they do to an extent. There has been uh, a question as whether or not animals have religious belief. Um, there is a perception, a theory, which is not to say it's true. It's a theory, but with any truth is a theory that is more or less true, uh, which is more or less proved enough that it can be accepted as reliable, which is what truth means. Uh, so what, so there is the idea that perhaps uh, some tribes of elephants have been observed to participate in moon worship. Um, or rituals that would be as if they were moon worship. So somewhat uh, interesting uh, in that extent, but it's a digression to this point. So um, we have plant, animal, and then machine, and then human. So human is really what, set, what makes us human, again, is the eviction from Eden. Before Eden, we were animal. And then after eating from the tree of knowledge, we progressed into human and then eventually into civilized human. Um, so child is dependent, incapable, non-agent, and adult is independent, capable, agent. And we can see this trajectory uh, here. So in regards to, yeah, vessel and soul, our soul is kind of connected to the ether uh, and we can then use... Um, the flame of, so in terms of like then what is considered virtue as virtue has evolved in the process of civil technologies over the millennia um, of at least human documentation um, because humans came prior to everything else so we already embed the wisdom from what came before uh, and I don't mean that in terms of like, I think, I don't want to embed the wisdom. I don't mean in terms of like a whole bunch of turtles got around and then talked to each other and then they became wise, right? I mean, in terms of evolutionary pressures caused that which was, maybe I'm, I'm misusing the term wise there. Um, 
whether or not an animal can be wise is perhaps incorrect. Um, what is the, hold up, let me look up the def, definition of wise. Having a strong experience, knowledge, and good judgment, sensible, prudent, having knowledge in a specified subject. Aware of, okay, so it's definitely not having knowledge in a specified subject that implies kind of a lot more um, progression along this line. However, having a showing experience, knowledge, or good judgment, that is definitely something animals can have. Some animals can be stupid, some animals can be smart, depending on the individual animal. <laughs> like they can be detrimental to their own well being. Um, or ones that, you know, engage in, in goodness. So, all right. Uh, so, yeah, so in terms of this kind of vessel, how we decide to use this vessel, we can use it to further the human spirit. And I think this is kind of the calling of humanity is to further the human spirit. Um, and the, or rather, more specifically, the flame of the human spirit. Because that flame, we will use this colloquially to say, my fire within was extinguished. And there is a great French philosophical movie about suicide called The Fire Within, and it is a suicidal man looking for a reason to live, and he interacts with his friends. Um, and we know this, like, through our language, and that's one of the terif terrifying in terms of in inducing terror aspects of not respecting the depth of one's language because there is such richness in in kind of these the words of our language that is so intentional because language is evolutionary but also intentional the survival of words is an evolutionary stuff but we so invent the words and that coalescing of what survives is very much intentional in the same way that any uh, human progress is um, and there's so much serendipity as one studies the language um, to that so Oh yeah, so there is this other darker force that the humanities has fought against, which is this reduction of human as machine. So let me play a, another uh, YouTube video. And this is something I saw when I was a teenager, uh, Charlie Chaplin machine. Um, this one, yeah. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful. But All right, that 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 music's very distracting. It's not in the original one. Let me get some, and it's probably going to get copyright strike if I keep that in. Here we go. I'm sorry, but I don't want to be a, an emperor. That's not my business. I don't want to rule or conquer anyone. I should like to help everyone if possible. Jew, Gentile, black man, white. We all want to help one another. Human beings are like that. We want to live by each other's happiness, not by each other's misery. We don't want to hate and despise one another. In this world, there's room for everyone, and the good earth is rich and can provide for everyone. The way of life can be free and beautiful, but we have lost the way. Greed has poisoned men's souls, has barricaded the world with hate, has goose-stepped us into misery and bloodshed. We have developed speed, but we have shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and feel too little. 
More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and gentleness. Without these qualities, life will be violent and all will be lost. The aeroplane and the radio have brought us closer together. The very nature of these inventions cries out for the goodness in men, cries out for universal brotherhood, for the unity of us all. Even now, my voice is reaching millions throughout the world, millions of despairing men, women, and little children, victims of a system that makes men torture and imprison innocent people. To those who can hear me, I say, do not despair. The misery that is now upon us is but the passing of greed, the bitterness of men who fear the way of human progress. The hate of men will pass and dictators die, and the power they took from the people will return to the people, and so long as men die, liberty will never perish. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes, men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines. You are not cattle. You are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate. Only the unloved hate. The unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery. Fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man, nor a group of men. But in all men, in you, you, the people, have the power. The power to create machines. The power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful. To make this life a wonderful adventure. Then in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world. A decent world that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. Let us fight for a world of reason. A world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite! All right, so the humanities has been fighting against this aspect, um, this malevolent ac aspect of humanity. Uh, which wishes to regress man back into machine, child, or animal. Uh, Charlie Chaplin there, or the character, Charlie, the actor Charlie Chaplin is playing in that movie, The Great Dictator, is communicating that when it comes to war or enterprise in terms of a politician wants dependent children. To an extent, there is... The Founding Fathers did not want that. Um, many politicians in the world don't want that. But one has to be careful in with politics especially is whether or not the politician is wanting a dependent child or whether a company is wanting machine instead of men. And the process of humanity is to spread the fire of humanity to as many people as possible and that therefore is what the humanities is about and why when the notion of empire is to remove self to make machine of civilization to civilize people to sacrifice self to become selfless for the cause and the reason why is because those at the top of a hierarchy must have self because without self, you are only circumstantial. Because you have no direction besides the mold that you fit within. So, for instance, if you're a square peg trying to fit in a round hole, to be selfless is to cut off your edges. 
so you fit and can comply with the means that were upon you. Whereas I'm just thinking about an edge case for that, which is to some extent, nature is also a round hole and we are square pegs. But a difference with nature, well, actually, there's not that much difference because to some extent, we can elect in ourself whether or not we wish to comply. And that's our ability to be one of the, the virtuous aspects. And this is the that Egyptian story of um, Horus, um, which is this going to the underworld to take the king's eye to become wise again and then rule against. And this is, uh, say, even in The Lion King, you go outside this sick, you are evicted by the evils and you're a child so you can only run. And then when you return, as an outsider, you can see the possession of the civilization by evil, which those within could not see its gradual seizure. It required the outsider. And then the outsider who left and then came back was able to heal their sickness. Um, so there is, so that the, the part of the mythology of that story or why it's in the mythos of the human spirit is because there is therefore reverence with this healing aspect, which mere obedience disrespects. And this is something which many cultures to today experience Expect obedience and loyalty as virtue. They will say, trust us, and you'll say, why? And then they'll say, don't be disrespectful. However, that is fragile because that is, again, a worship of man. It is a tribalism which to some extent, is very common with school dynamics, which is, is about friends and friend groups rather than what is true. And when you leave high school, which most people never go into the humanities, the everyday life therefore resembles the frontier of high school social development, which is politics is about who you are with and who you're against rather than, and who is right is who we are with. And we can see this with like the narrative around wars, which is when we fight a war, we are the good guys and we fight against the bad guys. But in the bad guys' perspective, they are the good guys and we're the bad guys. <laughs> uh, so all wars are fought for peace. But the notion of which peace is the one worth fighting for, if we are in a tribalistic frame, it is us. It's our side and their version of peace. And it takes the elite, which can be anyone with, with the embodiment of the characteristics of the elite, which is to say the, the training of this discipline of uh, exploration of these themes. Over a long period of time uh, to go beyond 
uh, this tribal to think what is ultimate rather than what is merely relative. Um, so the education was a huge proportion of that in the West and was equally commandeered by other forces. And I'm not, I'm sure it applies to many cultures, right? But you would have this in the humanities of, I guess, any culture, there is this idea of to become indoctrinated in the humanities to spread this fire. And then against forces that wish to make man God and make machines subservient to the man or children who are dependent, right? Which is, and this is one of the reasons why, like, it's been very surprising to watch YouTube debaters, <laughs> uh, not even YouTube debaters, but people in that kind of, what do you call it? Like, um, ah, yeah, that's what it was. This YouTube skeptic community of 10 years ago be perplexed as to uh, pedophilia. Now, the reason why pedophilia is a moral wrong is because it stunts the development of the child to progress into an adult because it takes away normal developmental steps that they would. So for instance, the child or the 13 year old hooking up with the 20 year old is now robbed of the opportunity to develop relationships with people their own age, which is gonna be far more successful for their ability to function in civilization than having a warped sense of relationships for the rest of their life. Now, in cultures that do not have such notion of a, of a civil quality around that age, then they are manifesting a civilization with different criteria. But in the West, it is about pairing with someone in a monogamous relationship where you have a family and you raise that family to then become adults and responsible, independent, capable agents, right? To then be their own gods with respect or with respect for the ultimate God, right? And then progress that. Uh, whereas, and, you know, there's more nuance there, but the point here is the that respect aspect um, and this willingness and this social obligation to transform uh, humans into, uh, transform, yeah, to acknowledge human as vessel plus soul. And the vessel may have its inadequacies and the soul obviously is expressed through the vessel. So if the vessel is damaged, as if a ship is damaged, then the will of the ship or the will of the P, the life giving qualities of the ship, which is the, the crew upon the ship in the same way, the life giving qualities of human is the cells and the hormones and the functioning and the thoughts and the memories and the faculties right of hu human is dependent on the the vessel itself so but there is a reverence for this ability to to wish for society to progress to it's kind of twofold and this is one of the things I struggled with for a long time is that society needs janitors and it needs garbage men and it needs these not like janitor is 
one would think, well, what's the problem? There is janitors and some may like the job. But think of a janitor as like, they're dealing with the excrete, like cleaning up the waste of human. And they're essentially like this kind of rebirth thing, like a janitor or a garbage man. Like, I think the reason why they are viewed as the lower rung is because they clean up the waste and the, the excesses of human civilization. But to some extent, it's like, well, unless everyone kind of has that kind of respect or wishes to embody janitor within themselves, right? And that's one of the things, which is like, as one becomes depressed, they fail to clean up after themselves. And as one becomes more spirited, uh, then they become more prudent. I think, yeah, prudent is probably the right word. Um, in the daily operations and also respectful. So for instance, there's a great YouTube channel um, called Cart Narcs. And it's this guy who goes around um, car parks and he tells people to put the trolleys away. Uh, and maybe 25% of people put it away, 25% of people have an argument and then they put it away, 25% of people flip the flip out and then 25% of people just drive off, right? So you kind of get like a estimate of how civilization functions, but it's kind of interesting because what's, what it's essentially is about is like, it's a good measurement of how much of a society is civilized in terms of people are taking it upon themselves to operate with a sense of, responsibility to the fellow man and a embodiment for themselves to ease the burden of their fellow men uh, rather than increase the burden of their fellow men. So these are all kind of things working towards that. So, but yeah, so if we have a company or a, a Monopoly, let's say. A monopoly is wishing to extinguish competitors and absorb everything within it. And that's why they, they will get fined for anti-competitive practices. But one of the sinister aspects of anti-competitive practices is that they fine or they fix the monopoly, which then assists in the survival of the monopoly against legitimate competitors. Um, whereas if a monopoly is allowed to continue as anti-competitive behaviors, then it forces the threshold turned of the consumer to decide to use a competitor. Whereas if the monopoly, the anti-competitive monopoly is fine, and then they rectify the situation, then the imperative to then move to a ethical competitor is therefore subsided and one will stay with the monopoly. Um, but the point is that in terms of the, and there's reasons why civilization rewards monopolies. One is that it is better for the productivity benefits against threatening empires, which is that the more that your empire can achieve homogenized prosperity, the better it is able to extinguish leg legitimate threats, but also extinguish illegitimate threats. Um, so for a legitimate versus illegitimate, we can think of the horrors that any Western empire or any empire has engaged with to protect itself. So for instance, Japan invading China to prevent the starvation of its own people, the, because it was denied emigration outwards, especially to Australia or for, um, uh, the racism of uh, Nazi Germany to go against the the privileged in its society, uh, or for um, United States just obliterating anyone who it wants its resources from. Um, so you have 
uh, these kind of devious aspects. But again, uh, those are all fought for peace. And it's where it becomes really challenging. So you have, let's say, companies such as, let's say, Google, Apple, and then the more that they can reduce or any uh, enterprise reduce the capacity of an individual to have self and operate as machine within company, then, and company, we can think of that even in military terms, in terms of one's company in the military, right? You are a machine of the company. And, or even in the East, the Dutch East India Empire or company, or the, the other type of companies that the British and the Dutch empires had, a company would own the Indies or India. And that company would be hired by the government. And to some extent, that's exactly the same as it is today, where all a government is, is just the means of working with companies to turn resources and materials and resource, including labor and material, including human into output for sustaining of country and country being physical and uh, uh, virtual. So uh, there is this big, big uh, uh, effective push towards reduction of regression of self to be effective be it a politician wishing for children, like for society to resemble children, or a priest for, you know, the same type of regression, or for the pedophile to also wish for that regression, or the Oedipal mother for wishing that type of regression, or the tyrannical father wishing for that type of regression, right? Or the tyrannical father may actually want a machine rather than a child. They have contempt for uselessness and they wish for just be useful. Whereas their Oedipal mother is kind of the, the other side. They actually want it to be useless so they can feel needed. Um, so there's a little difference there between the gender expression. Um, however, yes, you there is these kind of things that are against this fire. And we can see that in the movie, The First King. Um, let me pull that up, The First King. Yeah, here we go. This is brilliant. Highly recommended. I may actually do this as a watch together party. Um, it is so good. So I, in this, we have Romulus and Remus. Uh, Romulus and Remus. Um, and one of them, I can't remember which because I watched this movie last year, uh, is tyrannical and the other one is elected. And you can start to see the the faltering there between a ruler and a king and the birthing of king. Like, because if might is right, you have rulers, whereas democracy, you have king. And, you know, modern democracy, you have president, but democracy is in for the people. And the king took that responsibility incredibly seriously. And again, civilization until very recently operated where it was impossible to educate everyone. Where now it's finally possible. However, these dark aspects of humanity, the same aspects that do those horrific things, be it killing perfection, with the say the case of Jesus or whichever uh, spiritual story you wish or mythology you wish like this when we see we know that we can be perfect but we also know within ourselves when we see perfection we have a tendency to kill it um, this kind of humility that is afforded within us right and that killing is to make a scapegoat right 
Let's kill our best offering so we can vindicate ourselves, right? Like these are terrible aspects of 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 in civil humans and why the humanities has prospered civilization into greatness over the years, but also into increasing levels of of abuse. Uh, so we yeah we have this great uh, aspect there. Um, so yeah the this machine like quality so like say right now there's the social dilemma movie another great one the social dilemma um for people who aren't aware of the snowden revelations uh and any of those kind of whistleblower type things um the social dilemma is a great movie on how many companies and i've read like uh a per a a book like about um project management and they interviewed like Susan uh from YouTube uh and I apologize for having content there I, I'm sure she's great but I my content there when I said Susan is actually for this particular behavior and perhaps for her character because there's a lot of like this type of regression from the human spirit in the western oligarchs and the social network kind of goes into this where, and in the book, the example of the book that I read is Susan's team deliberately chose to increase watch time versus condensed time. So out of a choice between a three minute video that will get you what you want versus a 20 minute video that will get you what you want. They elected for the 20 minute video because they will earn more revenue. Like, this is the type of, like, sinister aspect where they view humans as resources rather than as people. And Social Dilemma kind of goes into this where the modern technology company is about being vampires of attention, where attention is the resource, and we are merely farmed for the attention. Kind of like the scene of The Matrix where... The humans are in the eggs um, and are harvested for our energy. It's the same thing now, but we're harvested for our attention. And that attention is being actively, and this has been true for thousands of years, has been actively manipulated to the mach machinery of the empire. Um so Sun Tzu's Art of War talks about using cognitive warfare and deception in to win. And it's the same thing that is still happening today, thousands of years later. Um, so this is, again, the importance of the humanities, um, which is to spread this fire of the human spirit with reverence and delicacy, because it can be extinguished. Fire can be extinguished and our faculties can go dark and we can decay into the underworld where we're out of the game. And we have the ability to not do that. Um, but we have to recognize the delicacy of our... Uh, situation um so yeah that that was and over time as i do these more and more and we can see my daily habit is to do this kind of every day these kind of things will get less like a two-hour live stream and more like 10 minutes and kind of keeping people up to date because i'm talking about five years of learnings specifically more around this february learning here when ideally i want it to be daily learnings um, so I don't have to overwhelm people on this journey that I've been on. I want to uh, have everyone be along on this journey. So with that said, streaks. All right, so with this, um, let me go back to Brave.
Uh, okay, I need to reconnect it. Bop, 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 bop. All right, yeah, so with uh, streaks, my goal is I'm kind of starting at rock bottom. Um, I used to be quite a successful person. Um, we can see a testament to myself. <laughs> my success at beelupton.com, but we can see my last update was in 2018 and that was my hope for 2019 and we can see you know my awards and everything but my life has been pretty hard and I'm not perfect so I make mistakes all the time and um so I'm pretty much at yeah rock bottom and I thought well what better time to get people along the journey for building myself back up. Um, so that's what I'm thinking uh, for these live streams is to go from uh, someone who is broken um, to someone who is uh, a resemblance of success once again. Um, and I think that's a journey worth watching and uh, one that I wish I did years ago so I could have watched that then and learned from it uh, so yeah uh, that's going to be uh, my goal here is to share this journey as a equal um, and uh, yeah so rather than have like a little banner to be like hey this is my weekly monetary goal please donate and sub so I can week this, meet this weekly monetary goal or you know like a musician like give me money so I can fund this or instead I think it's just better to maybe share with the audience an improvement of the processes we use to become successful together and collaborate on that process. So rather than collaborate on the system that makes me successful, let's collaborate on the process that makes each of us successful and collaborate and work together on that. Um, so, you know, I'm sharing this little streaks thing and, you know, as if people think that's a good idea, we can work together on that. And I have other projects that I think would be good. So I was thinking like, you know, I can, you know, each day go through my streaks. So I have my actual streaks like on, you know, as those little banners on, on the live streams and, um, have my bank balance across all my banks, um, across and we can see the uh, prosperity over the years as that seed germinates um yeah uh, so that was probably going to be quite surprising to this one viewer um but i think it'll be good i haven't particularly seen that many people do that and i think it's very needed to fight the forces that is pulling us under and uh, restore, utilize the parasocial for the humanities. Um, all right, so there was the finance stuff I want to go into. Uh, I will go in that tomorrow because I've got to jump on a meeting in two minutes. Um, and that will be in of itself something now maybe i'll do a little live stream at the end of the day but yeah we knocked off our little stream today so let me click on stream oh yep um growth yep so i clicked that earlier when i started this so share projects updates share books learning yeah so we'll click that and that one's done all right so maybe tonight i'll do some geogaster or you know, watch together. Maybe we can watch First King together. So, all right. Um, I got to go. I think that was good for this one. Two hours. That's that's more than enough time. 
for someone's attention. So uh, with that, I will uh, I'll be off. Let's let's end it with with one of tips tips music while uh, we go. So. Where did my cursor go? Oh my god. Okay. time